Okay. Okay. So, um, I've been giving this talk all day, and, and Tony joined me for, for the very last class, but um, I really hope this can be a little more um, casual and formal, and hopefully you all have a lot of questions for me, and for Tony as well. Um, so my name is Allegra Gimlin, I am St. Agnes class of 98, and... Um, Expect an applause there? No. <laughs> I've been talking all day. So, um, I am... Uh, where do I start? Okay. So after I left here... I had, uh, I had a plate early to BC in Notre Dame, and I said, that's it, that's where I'm going to go, and I went to Boston, and I realized it was a little too far away from home, so I came back, and I ended up at U of H, and got a degree in political science, and then I decided I didn't want to go to law school, so I worked in the restaurant industry for a few years, and while I did that, um, meanwhile, Cheesecake Factory moves me out to Hon Honolulu, and I worked at their location there for about a year, and that was what kind of got me interested in geology, was living, you know, Volcano Island. So that was fantastic. So back in 07, I went back to school, got my uh, undergrad in geology, and now I'm finishing up a master's. I interned at Shell this summer, and uh, I got a full-time offer, so I should be starting in January, assuming my thesis gets completely finished. So that's kind of my background. And then uh, we got Tony Torlucci here, and I'll let him tell you about this. Um, I graduated high school in 01, and I bounced around a lot, and started in architecture, didn't like that, and then I tried mechanical engineering, I didn't like that either. Then I, I just kind of landed in geophysics, and I wasn't really sure what it was, but I started working for a company, a seismic data processing company, and this was five years ago now, something like that, and um, so I kind of just fell into it, and I started geophysics, and I uh, just recently graduated, got my BS in uh, geophysics from U of H, and I'm uh, now working for Petroleum Geoservices as a geophysicist. So today we've kind of put together a talk about um, careers in geology and geophysics. Um, but before I start, have any of y'all even thought about going into one of these fields? Got one hand. Is there a parent involved at all? Yeah, my dad's a geologist. Okay, he's a geologist. Fantastic. Well, um, it's you'll kind of see as I go through the talk, it's not just geology and geophysics. There's a lot of offshoots of this. In fact, uh, petroleum engineering is really huge, and they really need petroleum engineers. So if any of y'all are interested in engineering, that's something to kind of consider. But uh, I've put together, we've put together kind of just a very broad overview of, um, you know, where you can go in the world with, with this career, um, you know, what it takes when you're in school to kind of get through all the coursework and, you know, graduate, and, and then lastly, kind of, what are the real world applications? What would I be doing day to day if I were in this field? And most of it centers around the oil industry because that's what both Tony and I do, or I will be doing um, when I'm done. And, you know, just as we're going through, ask questions and uh, so I'll get I'll get moving so this is in Alaska this is the uh, Atikan Valley and as you can see there's kind of this this road running through it and right next to it is actually the Alaska pipeline so this is just one of the many inspiring places that geology can be done in this world and uh, in fact Shell's about to drill in Alaska or I don't know if the season's already over but Alaska's kind of the next frontier so if you haven't thought about it uh, what you want to do in your career, perhaps now is the time to start thinking about it. And, uh, you know, you can be very general. You know, ask yourself some questions like, you know, would I like a career in science with lots of challenge? And, uh, well, because you're part of the engineering club, obviously science is something good for y'all. Um, do you like technology and want to be at the leading edge of new advances in computer applications? Um, you know, com com uh, computers and technology are huge in this industry. Um, a lot of the large companies have their own proprietary software. They have people developing it, writing algorithms, and things of that nature. So there's a lot of opportunity with that. Well, um, let, me go, let me interject. Yes. Um, so we're all familiar with servers at this point, right? So we, everything's done in the cloud. We all have our iPhones and tablets, and you know, everything is done at super fast speed. Ugh, super fast speeds. And uh, you guys have seen clusters or servers, right? Where you have multiple computers tied together. You guys heard of these or seen these? You're familiar. Actually, why they admitted those because seismic surveys were getting so large, and to process all of this stuff, you needed really, really fast computers. So actually, servers were invented for the seismic industry, and now, of course, that Google uses them, and Yahoo, and yeah, yeah, everyone else uses them. Those are fantastic. But it's interesting that the, it's one of the reasons they were created. Yeah. yeah so um, something else. Um, Geology, geophysics, it's a fast paced team environment. You work on you know, a short project, you finish that, and you're on to the next one. There's constantly something going on. 
it's constantly changing. There's something different. To me, that was one of the draws and the you know, attractions to the field. Um, you know, do you want to do work that is important to the world? And of course, we all know that we have to put gas in our car, and that's important. But something that we forget to think about is every day we get up and we use products that are you know, made out of plastic. Well, plastic is a byproduct of the oil industry. So every day you're using something that you know, requires people like us to find and get oil out of the ground. So we're not moving away from that anytime soon. We're just kind of trying to expand our, our uh, energy resources for the future. And then lastly, do you want excitement, adventure, and travel? I think that's probably a yes for most of us. And that's all available too. So, you know, so then that's what you want out of a career. Well, what are you good at doing? You know, are you good at science and math? Um, if so, this is a really good place to look. Um, but you can also be creative, a good communicator, and you definitely have to be a good team player. If you can't work well with others, they are not going to want you. You know, especially because you're working with people from around the world of different ages, of different you know genders, races, and ethnicities whatever other diversity terms they're not including, but um, they like people that can work well with others. Um, do you like working with computers? Yeah, we know how important that is. And uh, do you want to tell about those images? Yeah, let me jump in real quick. So, uh, both of these are obviously computer-generated images of the subsurface, but I'm going to jump in right here. You know, we're talking about working as a team and, you know, what actually happens. And this is, I'm in a meeting just like this uh, almost once a week, sometimes, you know, two or three times a week, where we're sitting in front of a computer screen and, you know, my boss is flipping through, or there's someone who's created this PowerPoint and this presentation, or they're showing it on their uh, our own visualization software, and, well, this is what we're seeing, and this is the process we run, and this is what we're doing, and everyone's getting together as a team and saying, well, you know what, I don't like that, or, or what was the filter you used to create this, or, you know, it, it's just cool, and for me, I get excited, I'm like, well, what was the geeks get together, I'm like, yeah, I'll do that, yeah, no, oh, that's horrible, we do that. Um, it, it's, I don't know, it's just really cool. Um, and again, so these are like the images we get to see now. Of course, you didn't see these 20 years ago. But um, talk a little about this. So this is a, a, this, what you see here is a seismic inline or cross line. It's like a plane of what the uh, subsurface looks like. Right. 2D. A 2D, yeah, 2D section through that. And can anyone guess what uh, what these structures are in light blue that are coming out? That's it. That's uh, salt diapers. It's salt moving up. Uh, it's just, it's really, really, it's getting easier, but it's still pretty difficult to image some of the stuff around here. That's uh, one of the challenges that they're working on right now. And that's something that you see a lot in the Gulf of Mexico, especially, is, is trying to image this, this salt that's out there. And um, so, moving forward. Um, do you like to solve problems? Because that's a lot of what's involved with this. Yes, yes oh, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, rhetorical, yes. And uh, are you well organized or good at multitasking? Because a lot of times you're working on multiple projects at one time, so you've really got to be able to, you know, focus on, on each one and get each part of that project done. Um, you know, something I did, I got to see this summer that was really exciting is um, they did a Gulf of Mexico lease sale. And so leading up to that, it gets pretty frantic. Um, you probably, I don't know how familiar you are. The, basically, the Gulf of Mexico is broken up into a bunch of blocks. And then those blocks, they're called protraction areas. Those blocks are broken up into much smaller blocks that are, you know, about, I think, three miles by three miles, and those are lease areas. And every year the government rents those out to the highest bidder. So, for instance, I think the most exciting um, lease that uh, happened this summer, there was a, you know, a couple of companies that bid on this one area, and they're seeing you know, like three million here and four million there, and then somebody comes in with like a $28 million bid for this one block. And the next thing you know, Stat Oil has like $158 million bid for that block. And when it comes to the government, the highest number wins, period. So Stat Oil won that outright. But before you could even get there and depend, you know, decide how much money you're going to put on these blocks, you know, you got to figure out, well, is it worth it? Um, so uh, people buy data from companies like Tony's, who works for a service company. They're the guys who do all the acquisition. And then they look through this data and have to see, okay, do I see something? Is there a great prospect? Is there potential for us finding, you know, a lot of oil here? So a lot of the people on my team had been working on multiple projects, trying to work up a bunch of different prospects. And they took those, presented them to the managers, and then the managers kind of ended up deciding, well, where do we want to put our money? So this this summer, Shell spent about four hundred million dollars in the lease sale, and we won, I think, twenty four of the thirty four blocks we bid on. And uh, there was a lot of money put on the table this summer. So that was really fascinating, and that was kind of one of the exciting things that goes on. And then that was done, and then it was okay, on to the next project. So it's kind of
some exciting and fast-paced stuff and environments. So, you ask, what can I do with a degree in geology and geophysics? Besides the oil industry, of course. Um, there is potential in academia. Of course, you have to do your PhD. Um, there are some pure research positions out there, but those are definitely few and far between. Um, there are some professorships. Those are kind of half teaching, half research. And you have to keep bringing in the grant money, too. So they want you to continue researching, but they don't give you the money. You have to go seek it out yourself. So that's where like, the National Science Foundation is huge. Um, but if you have great ideas, I think my professor, my advisor, got $250,000 from them. And you know, they give out these huge grants to do research, so it's kind of fun. Um, if you are a geologist or a geophysicist, you could be an interpreter, which is what I like to do. And in fact, my mentor this summer has his PhD in theoretical physics. Theoretical. And he's now an interpreter. He decided he wanted to kind of switch his um, focus and where he wanted to go. And so he's in the oil industry now. String theory of rocks, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there's the citrate data processing. Of course, that's what Tony does. So please feel free to ask him any questions you want about that. Um, kind of the nice thing about processing is they're doing so much of it right now that you can actually finish with your bachelor's, at least to start out, and go directly into a processing position. And um, they're not just acquiring new data, they're actually reprocessing old stuff. So, so data they have from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they're taking kind of these new techniques and running these, these data through it again to see if they can get a better picture. Um, because one of the best places to find oil is where you've already found it. So, moving forward, there are some field geology positions out there, and um, as I love field geology, but these are, again, kind of few and far between. That's where you actually get to go out in the fields, you know, hike the mountains, actually do you know, physical mapping. That's something fun. So the USGS is the US Geological Society. They're kind of the ones that still have those positions. Again, it's kind of more of a PhD type, type role. But there are some other options with your science degree. Um, there's hydrology, so I have a friend of mine who's up in um, upstate New York, and he's drilling water wells. Um, there's environmental geology, so you know if we're concerned about um, you know some of the tanks that these well companies have buried, maybe they've been storing some nasty stuff, and you know, checking up on them, making sure they're not leaking chemicals into the groundwater or anything like that. So there's there's a couple different ways to go with this. Well, a lot of different ways to go, really. You'll kind of see some more as I go through. Um, where would you like to work? Somebody asked me this question, and you know, they said, "Would you like to work at the beach?" And I said, "Absolutely." Um, there's, but there's other, you know, mountains. There's the desert, the ocean, the jungle. Geology can be done in all those places. So what I'm going to show you next are a bunch of images of, you know, where you can do the work and some of the work that people are doing. So uh, my first example of working at the beach is um, in Ireland, actually. So one of uh, my buddy's from UH. He's working um, with zircons. So, let me see if I can find my mouse. So, right here you see I've kind of marked this mid Atlantic ridge. Well, before that ridge was there, before it started spreading, these, these coastlines actually of Newfoundland and Ireland, they think we're probably right next to each other. So, of course, now they're this far apart. What he's done is actually fly to both islands and collect rock samples, disaggregate them, and find these zircons. These are actually. Um, cathode luminescent images of these, and it looks like they've got tree rings almost. Well, you can actually put them under the microprobe, shoot them, and get age dates for each of those rings so you can find out how old these zircons are and try and kind of recreate that tectonic picture. So that's what my friend Adrian's been doing. Um, and something cool about zircons too. So we know the Earth's about 4.567 billion years old. The oldest zircon dated is about 4.35 billion years old. So these things have been around for a long time, as my professor likes to joke. They say diamonds are forever. He's like, eh, zircons are forever. So, anyway, but up, up. Uh, here's the field area where Adrian was working. I know. Um, it's a bad joke. Um, That's the one downside of geology. You've got to deal with a lot of bad jokes. But, uh, yeah, yep, rock on. Uh, anyway, so this is one of the beaches that Adrian was collecting rocks on in Ireland. It's a tough field area, I know. Look at those gorgeous, you know, vistas and some of the cool rock formations. So that's one area he worked in. And of course, this is where I had to do my field work in Costa Rica. I know, it should feel terrible for me, right? Um, and then this is northwest Costa Rica. This is the Santa Elena Peninsula. And in this red box, all of this coastline 
was where I did my field work. So I actually went out and I was looking at turbidites. Let me see if I can go ahead and put up a couple pictures here. Um, these turbidites, they're, they're deep water mass transport complexes. And so, you know, what might happen, for instance, is you might have an, earth, an earthquake that comes along, kind of, you know, shakes your slope and it creates this turbidity current that carries all of this stuff out to the really deep water. And um, I think back in the, it was like the 50s and 60s, people just couldn't understand how you got sand out to deep water. And then somebody finally figured out what was going on. So anyway, we've got these turbidates here. No papers really published. I'm just doing some geochemical work. So I went down there and collected 100 pounds worth of rocks. Uh, and you can see, again, these lovely dipping layers. And what I found, I was actually doing some structural gel geol is there too. And you've got uh, all of this that was originally horizontally deposited got smushed at some point. So you're actually seeing a lot of, um, you know, kind of hills and valleys and anticlines and climbs throughout here. So that was pretty cool. And then this is what a geologist in the field looks like. I'm on the beach, but I'm wearing hiking boots and I have like a big rock hammer and it's probably scaring all the tourists while I was out there. But so that's that's the beach field area. My ideal field area would be the Bahamas. There's a whole carbonate platform out there. It's absolutely fantastic. But there's no one there. So um, the mountains, and I think this is really cool. Um, we have some amazing structural geologists at U of H, and both of them work in the Himalayas. One of them is working in the Pamir, um, which is in western China. It's the western edge of the Himalayas here. And then uh, Dr. Murphy is working in Nepal and the Himalayas there, and they're doing a lot of kind of reconstructions and that kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of geochemistry as well. So they kind of do a little bit of both. But I just want to show you some of their field areas, the mountains. This is in the Pamir, this is a valley that they uh, hiked through. And then that's my buddy Dan taking probably some measurements on the, uh, the rocks out there. And then this is Dr. Murphy and this is in the Himalayas in Nepal. Some of his students, and they actually do take Sherpas up to the mountains with them. Um, they don't see civilization for weeks. They typically go up about six weeks. It's really hard to get out there, and uh, while they were there, they got caught in a little bit of a snowstorm. So uh, it was tough working conditions, but they were able to get some information out of it, and so they're working on some, some reconstructions there. So another fantastic place. Um, a little closer to home now, we're back in the States, um, a couple of really nice build areas. One of my favorite places now in the U.S. is Montana, and I don't know if any of you has anyone been to Montana before? Okay, so you probably know how absolutely gorgeous it is there. Well, U of H hosts our, it's our capstone project. So after you take all your coursework, you have to do a field camp. So the geology one is six weeks. We do multiple mapping projects, and I've actually got um, some of my maps that I can show you that I'm able I was there. Um, they also host a geophysics field camp that Tony did. How long is that? Two weeks. Two weeks? No. Okay, and so I've got some pictures from both of our experiences. Um, and that's, but that's a fantastic place to do geology. I'll also show you some, some images from, where are we? From Colorado, and from one of my friends did her field work there, and a couple of places in Utah. So, here's a geophysicist how it works. I'll let Tony explain what he was doing there. Um, so yeah, this is Montana. This is right outside where, uh, where our camp is. And you have to wake up to you know, these kind of views every day. It's just absolutely beautiful. But while we were out there, you know, we did, um, we had a chance to put our hands on a few different techniques that exploration geophysicists use. Uh, one is the seismic reflection method, another is the seismic refraction method. So we have various tools for inputting the seismic energy into the ground, and we have the tools for recording as well. Um, so there you go, here we go. This is the, uh, the virus size truck, and you can see the back end here is actually lowers to the ground, and once it pushes on the ground, it starts pulsating, and it sends this seismic energy into the subsurface. And it, it, it travels through and it bounces off different layers whenever you have a change in rock properties. You know, so if you've got a sand over a shale, uh, they've got two different velocity contrasts and density contrasts. Well, you get reflections at that, uh, at that boundary. And that, that's what we're measuring. That's what we're looking for. And um, what else? <laughs> the magnetic method and the gravity method. So we, we measure changes in the magnetic field, changes in the gravity field, and, and try to map that and see what it looks like and make some estimates of what we think may be going on. Um, we also did some well log testing where we dropped uh, log information down a hole and, and ran logs and got to look at it. Uh, I know we've got a picture, I think the next one is the full waveform. Yeah, so this is a full waveform sonic log. Um, I guess for those of you who want to go into engineering, you, some of you may go into um, some kind of production engineering, you know, where you're working for oil well Varco is one of them, something I can think of right now, but things like that. 
So you build these systems, and this one right here, it, it sends a tool down, down the hole, and then as we bring it up, it makes these like clicking sounds, and that click is a very, very small seismic wave, and it travels up the hole, and then we have receivers in, the, in this tool, and what it's measuring is actually the waveform that's coming back into each receiver. And then we do some processing on that to create some image, images of what the hole looks like right around that area. The GPR card. Uh, another way we image is through um, electromagnetic waves, or ground, this is a ground penetrating radar. And um, this car right here is the, I think it's a 250 megahertz transducer and receiver in there. And um, obviously you can see this big pull up here, you guys are familiar with that, it's a GPS, so you know where you are. And we just send radio waves, you know, electromagnetic waves into the earth, and we you know, measure the reflections that come back. And it's, a, it's another way we image the layers underneath. You know, whether it's um, gravel or sand, or if you're watching, if you watch bones, um, you know they find bodies. And archaeologists use it to find dinosaurs, especially if they're very shallow. You know, but um, the higher, higher, uh, higher frequencies get better resolution. They don't see as deep, but they do get better resolution. I think I want to say around two, two and a half centimeters of resolution. So you, know, you actually can't see the bones. And this is much more shallow than using like the fiber size truck. They're trying to get much deeper images. And this is, what do you two, say? Two and a half meters to 10 meters. I think they at 100 megahertz, which is pretty low. You're, you're only going to see about 10 and a half meters, I believe. Yeah, like last year for Earth Science Week, we actually had the card out of the museum and we were trying to get a pitch to image, you know, maybe some of the plumbing in the main hall with that. That's about as deep as you're going to go. So, so back to geology. Um, so this is actually one of the formations that we saw up there, and this is, to me, it's one of the coolest things. Um, one of the, the main principles of geology, Steno came up with these back in the 1800s at some point, but is the, the principle of original horizontality. So when rock is deposited, or when these mineral grains are deposited, they're deposited horizontally. But you can see these layers aren't doing that. So at some point, these were actually moved from the horizontal to you know, that 90 degree position. Some of them are even being overturned further than that. Uh, this is, I don't have anything for scale, unfortunately, in this picture, but I mean, it was just this huge deposit. These are the Triassic red beds. So they're still incredibly old. Um, just an absolutely gorgeous formation. This was um, right after our death march. <laughs> they made us go up this incredibly shaly hill and take some measurements. And um, as we were coming back down, one of my girlfriends actually slid into a uh, snake den and pulled it off her leg, Kate, pulled yeah. off her leg and threw it away. But so we have fun. Sometimes it's a little dangerous. Yeah. Um, this is me. This is a, a different area of the mountains, but still those see Triassic red beds. And this is a, a mine. But you can see, again, those, those vertical layers through here. And something that I took for granted coming from Texas, we always did field work at Big Bend. And Big Bend's a desert. So there's no you know greenery or trees or grass covering a lot, these, of, a lot cactus. of cactus. A lot of cactus. <laughs> but uh, you know these exposures are all very easy to see. So when we went up into the mountains in Montana, all of a sudden you're having to work a lot harder to figure out you know where your rock units are. So this was this was a very nice exposure for us to see. Um, and here's one of our field mapping areas. So I told y'all that's my friend Steve. Um, he's from the East Coast. But uh, <laughs> he's a. Uh, He's in our field area, and we actually had to, to walk around and, and map this area. So again, here's here's what I was talking about. Here, it's really hard to see these exposures, but the cool thing is, is you can still make a map from that. You just have to look a little bit harder for where these rock units are exposed. So this is uh, it's probably the map I'm most proud of. I got the highest grade on this one of my work, but uh, you can kind of see there's some really cool metamorphic units over here. You can see where I've been able to map in the river valleys. And, you know, where they finger out, and uh, that's probably some easier stuff to actually map because it's, it's obvious and it's visible and it's on top of everything. So we have, we make these surficial maps, and then what they have us do is you can probably see these lines running through here. Um, they have us do cross sections, what's actually going on underneath the surface, and this is really just an interpretation for us because we don't have all the fancy equipment. We were just trying to, you know, use the knowledge we, we gained from me in the classroom, but these are the two cross sections that I made based on the map. So you can see this really large normal fault running through here and how it's kind of moved the different layers. There was actually kind of a, a paleo weathered surface that all this deposited on. So just, you know, again, this is one of the projects they have us do about five or six mapping projects. And um, that was a lot of fun. So that was Montana. Now this is Colorado. 
Um, this isn't precisely geology, I think it's a little bit more geomorphology, but uh, Rose mapping, you can see all those dead trees, and she was mapping kind of the blowdown effect of you know, what happens when you've got these dead trees, maybe they're going down the river, or you know, being moved, and they're changing the geomorphology of the area. So you, that's her at the river making some sort of measurements. And then this is Crystal Geyser, this is in Utah, and this is actually a cold water geyser. Most of the ones when you think about geysers, when you think of Yellowstone, those are all hot water geysers, and they're depositing these rocks, these travertines. So what my friend was doing was actually getting samples from the one, uh, the cold water geyser. Um, she was doing some geochemical tests to see, you know, the, the composition of those and making comparisons with these hot water geysers to figure out, you know, if there's any sort of difference and why. So that was what she was doing, and then, oops, wrong way. Another big project the UH has going on. This is Dr. Janet Guadacharya, he's our department chair now, but he runs this very large consortium through UVH, and it's funded by oil companies. And this, this rock that you see behind him is this kind of ancient delta, it's called the Farron Delta, and he and his grad students have been studying this for years, and they're using it as an analog for you know, modern deltas and for ancient deltas. And the oil companies like it because if we understand how deltas are formed, we can understand where we want to look to find oil. So, you know, where are the best sands being deposited? You know, how are these channels forming? Where are they forming? Um, you know, where are the shales being deposited? So we can kind of, if we can understand this, we might be able to better understand where we need to drill, you know, under the ground where we can't see it, where it's not exposed. So they've been working on that for years, and they do very detailed descriptions. Sometimes they're just, you know, getting a small section of the rock and point counting the grains and describing how well-rounded it is, and it gets very detailed. Um, and then this is in New Mexico, this is the Abbey Q Formation, and uh, some of Tony's class went out there and they did mapping in this area. Just absolutely gorgeous again. So, the point is, there's some really great field areas out there, and you're still doing science. Um, and in geology, you get to go. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, and then of course, you're probably thinking, how do you do geology in the middle of the ocean? Well, it can be done. Um, my advisor works with mantle rocks. Well, the only place to actually get mantle rocks is where there's a rift in the crust and these mantle rocks have come up. So he goes out, you can see just for reference, China's over here and here's the Philippines. He goes out, this is a, a rift system actually, and this Paracea Vela rift is not active anymore, but at one point it was, and these mantle rocks were actually coming to you know, the surface of the crust. So he goes out there on a big ship like this. Uh, he's got a, a bunch of scientists he works with in Japan as well, and they go out together. And they use these submersibles, and you can see about the size of that. There's three scientists that they can kind of get in there at one time, and that's uh, John, my advisor, right there. And uh, on this particular trip, they went down about 5,500 meters to the ocean floor, and this, you know, submersible has mechanical arms, and they collect samples. And then he takes them back to the lab at U of H and, and does geochemical analyses on these. And ultimately he's trying to figure out, you know, what's the mantle made of, how much garnet is in there, how much iron, how much magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one exciting thing you can do in the ocean. Another one, you want to tell them what this is too? Yeah, um, so, you know, we're doing exploration all over the world. And, you know, one place that's actually blowing up is, you know, um, in the Arctic. So we've actually, the company I work for, um, this is a slide from one of their uh, brochures. But, you know, we've built these machines here that are doing acquisition, seismic acquisition, underneath the ice. You know, so you've got this big layer of ice, then you've got water while there's rocks under there. We believe there is oil, potentially oil under there. So, you know, we've got these machines here that some engineers designed and they built. And uh, there's another place where we're looking for oil and uh, we're doing research. And then some other options, U of H actually has a really good relationship with the Thompson Space Center. So they give us meteorites to study. And the big deal with that is apparently some of these iron meteorites, like one gram of them is about $10,000 on the black market. Um, so it's, it's kind of a big deal that they trust us with that. And they actually come and do random audits to make sure the samples are still there. But um, and what's really cool I like about this picture is this etching that you see on this meteorite this guy's holding, that's some natural etching that happens when it's plummeting down to the earth. It's quite interesting. Um, and of course, if I were still in Hawaii, I'd probably be studying volcanoes, probably seismology, you know, trying to understand tsunamis, things of that nature. And there's also um, oceanography, that's another branch of kind of the earth sciences so that's um, a lot of fun and interesting. So, all right, if you want to do geology, what kind of university coursework would you have to do? So, 
and I would say this is pretty standard across most of the, uh, the universities. Um, mineralogy is your typical lead out class. It is uh, you know, understanding the crystal structures and how they form and why they form. And there's mirror planes, and yeah, he didn't like that class. Um, but have any of y'all been to the Gem and Mineral Hall at the Museum of Natural Science? Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, they've got some amazing examples of these crystals that formed you know, in nature, and they formed their perfect kind of crystal shape. So you can see uh, pyrite, fool's gold, right? It forms perfect cubes. Um, garnets form I think, dodecahedrons. Um, some of them are, you know, bipyramidal, you know, hexagonal shapes. And, and so if they form perfectly, that's what they look like. So it's really interesting. You kind of learn about that. You learn some of the chemistry. But unless you become a crystallographer, that's probably the last time you'll see that. So the next step is petrography, which is um, looking at thin sections of rocks or under the microscope. And uh, I TA'd this class bit, uh, three times, and it's a lot of fun. It's actually learning to distinguish among the different minerals that you might find in rocks. You know, saying, I can look at this and say, okay, here's some quartz, here's some plagioclase, you know, here's some olivine. And it just kind of tells you the environment these rocks formed in. Um, if you find garnet, that's a metamorphic rock. Um, and then field methods and structure, you saw kind of what we do with that, the, the field mapping, things like that. Um, stratigraphy, that was what they were doing with the delta. Um, petrology, that's understanding you know, how these different rocks form and what environments it means metamorphic said. And then lastly, intro to geophysics, which is probably not my favorite course. And those are the, the typical foundations. Um, you can go on and take some kind of upper level electives if you go geology or geophysics. I loved the carbonates course, which is why I really want to go to the Bahamas now. Um, and the other flip side of that is you have to be very strong in chemistry. You have to have um, a background in calculus-based physics. Um, to be a geologist, you just have to complete all your calculus, and that's kind of enough for geology. To be a geophysicist, you tell them all the math classes extra. Um, so yeah. engineering math, which is linear algebra and ordinary differential equations, and then they'll take partial differential equations, and then they'll take complex analysis. So there's uh, there's an extra three math courses for um, geophysics, and then we don't take these petrology courses. Uh, we take geophysics electives instead. Uh, you know that are, are more focused on geophysics rather than the uh, yeah, the yeah, chemistry. Yeah, why they formed. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so now getting into, okay, we've gone through school, you know what you have to do to get through school. Oh, something that you told me to emphasize, and maybe you want to, I don't know, um, grades, of course. Um, because I was doing grad school, um, I just didn't think about your grades throughout the whole thing, but when these companies, you know, look at your transcripts, they're looking at undergrad, they're looking at grad, they're looking at everything they can got to get their hands on. So, of course, emphasis on grades, which I'll probably already know anyway, because y'all are going to school at SA and SJ. But just you know, something to keep in mind is that this, this stuff doesn't go away for quite a while. Um, the better your grades are, the more potential you have to get grants, and the you know, less money out of your pocket and your parents' pocket, and you know, you've got yeah, scholarships. And if you've got really great grades and you're a shoe in to, uh, to be a TA or an RA, which means you get paid to do your research that you have to do anyway. So instead of working at you know, working various jobs, you you're doing your research. You, you know, don't get paid much, but. It's better than nothing. So, anyway, so moving on. So we're beyond school now, and, and let's look at kind of industry, which is what Tony and I both are going to be doing, or what he does now. So um, we're looking for oil and gas around the world. So this is a map courtesy of ExxonMobil, and these are probably most of the major oil and gas fields in the world. There might be a few others. This is probably a couple of years old. And um, on top of looking for oil and gas, there's also kind of you know what are termed unconventional. So we're looking for methane things like that out there too. So we're trying to expand our, our idea of what energy is, but oil is still the foundation of it right now. So I'll let you get some water and I'll talk about this. Okay. Um, first of all, before we get into this, anybody have any questions? Have we lost anybody? And anybody just like, okay, you guys can shut up now? Yeah. Yes? Don't yeah, you're stuck with us. All right. Um, well, it's, these two images right here from the company I work for, and this is one of our vessels. It's really, it's actually pretty large. I haven't been on it yet, yet. I hope to get on it pretty soon. Um, and this right here is a survey. I'm actually working on a, a illustration of this survey. So we've got this boat, right? And it's pulling along 10 streamers. And each streamer 
has got these hydrophones in it, right? And the hydrophone, basically what it does is it measures pressure waves. So, you know, we, we send a pulse out into the water, right? And it sends this pressure wave through the water, it bounces off the ocean floor, and it goes down into the rocks, it comes back up, and then it finally reaches the surface. These are the source boats over here. They're shooting, and these waves are coming down, they're reflecting back up, and then it reaches these um, hydrophones. And the, it, it spits out a trace, right? Uh, a wiggle, we call it. I don't know, it's just really, really interesting. And again, this, the boat right here, this one's got 10 streamers. Each streamer, which is the, the cable of hydrophones, has got 648 phones. And those phones are spread out at 12 and a half meters. And if you do the math, it's over like 8 kilometers long. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how large these, these surveys are. And um, that's pretty much it. Oh, I guess as you can see it here, you know, here's the, the pressure wave coming down. And, bounces off the rock and comes back and it's recorded in these streamers. And what would I do? I do the processing after all of the acquisition is done. Uh, I think there's another trace display page next. Yeah. Kind of flip over that. Next. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah, but ultimately, you know, we want to get where this cube is on top. We're trying to get a picture like that. So somebody like me, who's an interpreter, can try and figure out what's going on down there. But of course, there's all these steps in between. So another example. Oh, um, <laughs> okay, it's the same thing. So right, this, this is a vibrosized truck, so this is what would happen on land. Well, yeah, these waves are propagating through the earth, and then they're recorded up here. The challenge is, well, we've got these recordings of the waves, and we're only recording it on the surface here, but how do we actually make an image of what's going on yeah. below us? How do we see what we can't see? And, and that's the real trick of geophysics, I and mean, what we're, we're trying to do here. Um, Oh, there's more images. So there's the big vibrosized trucks that would uh, companies like Western Geco would use or Global. Um, we don't actually do any land. The company I work for is strictly marine, which is sold off all of the land stuff. Uh, this right here is a geophone. So those of you in physics are familiar with um, coils and magnets, right? You ever dropped a magnet through a coil? What happens? Anybody? Anybody done that in physics? Well, you get a uh, you get a current, right? Or if you take a, if you take a magnet, and you've got a coil, and you've got these. Uh, the ends hooked up, and you pass that magnet through that coil, you're going to get an alternating current, right? And that's what happens here. As this moves up and down, as the Earth shakes, because we've sent the seismic energy through, the magnet on the outside, the coil on the inside, moves, and it's, that's what we record. We actually record that digital, um, that digital trace. So, change of magnetic, remember this for physics, change of magnetic flux induces a current. You'll need to know that later. There'll be an exam. There will be an exam. There'll be an exam at the end. This is just, and these are just some images of, of where they're doing these surveys. And geo, some of these geophysicists, what they do is design these surveys, and some of them are huge. This is a guy in, you know, the middle of Africa planting geophones, and here's some other guys in the middle of the desert in Africa. Or this might be in the Middle East, I can't really remember, but planting geophones. And so, you know, we do these surveys wherever we can. Um, this is another image of just you know, you know trying to do some surveys in the mountains, and they've got you know helicopters dropping stuff off. We probably don't have as many guys working there, but they've uh, developed some ways to do kind of some of these well surveys in remote regions. It's interesting. I was actually on a survey uh, out in East Texas. Uh, CG Veritas was the acquisition company, and well, what they use these helicopters for is because you can see all the all the cables that guy was holding. You know, well that's just one. And then you've got all the phones and everything else. Well, what the helicopter does, you know, we're talking about, you know, thousands of square miles uh, of collection. So a helicopter will swing and they'll drop all the cables. And then the, the juggies, the guys that put the phones in the ground, they'll go and they'll pick them up and they'll carry them. And then once they're done, they'll pick up the old stuff and they'll carry it to one location, put it back. A helicopter comes, picks it up, takes it, takes it back to another location where you get someone there actually going through all the stuff and making sure that it's okay. And then it's picked up again and dropped off. And, it's a huge process, and it's actually amazing how well it runs. But uh, it's really fascinating. And they, the, the survey I was on, they had three choppers, you know, two were running it at, at all times, you know, just picking stuff up and moving it around. And boom, boom, boom. And there's a guy in the doghouse, that's what we call it, the guy who's actually doing the recording, um, who's got to keep track of all this. That's, that's amazing. I can't keep track of my shoes. <laughs> And this is just, you know, Tony's talking about their um, magnetic and gravity data, so they're collecting this in the airplane. And then here's, you know, some geophysicists looking for water in Malawi. Kind of not oil related, but snuck it in there. So here's the, the processing part. We'll end up talking about that. 
this is the traces we were talking about, that seismic wave that's being propagated through the Earth, and it comes back and it, and it spits out what we call a wiggle trace. Right? And again, we talked about the, uh, we'll, we'll refer to land here. It kind of looks like a, a 48, yeah, 48 channel, probably a land shot. So, that coil's moving up and down in the magnets, creating this trace. And so, as it moves up and down, like I said, it's going to reverse polarity, right? It's alternating currents, but sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. And the, the higher the amplitude is of that movement, we get a larger amplitude in the current. That's output. Almost possible. It's faster it moves. It's been a while since I've had physics too. Anyways, so we get these currents, right? We get these uh, traces. And what we do is we go through all these different processing steps to try and turn this into an image that actually looks like geology. And, and that's, the, uh, that's the magic. You know, that's the, that's the really cool part. It's several steps. I won't get into it. But it's, for me, it's something. That's what I do. It's what I love to do. It's, it's awesome. So, and then after they go through all that, here's uh, the picture on the bottom left corner. That's a beam migration. And, you know, I, I'm going to say this with my correct but, you know, I think once they kind of create the picture, they can use all these different methods of, of migration and things like that to kind of clean up the picture, try and get a better picture. I have a couple of good slides I'll let him talk about. <laughs> okay. I know that that's because that's exactly what our office looks like. <laughs> and um, also, see this guy right here? It's really cool. Um, it's called a 3D Space Mouse. And I just I just started with this company about a month and a half ago when I saw this. I freaked out. Uh, have you guys seen, like, a familiar with AutoCAD? You're all in engineering, right? You've done AutoCAD, you've built some 3D models, right? Or have you ever used a program called Blender? You ever heard of Blender? It's an open source program. All right. So you build this 3D model and you're using your mouse to kind of move it around, right? But do you guys have a Space Mouse? Have they got that set up for you yet? Dude, get one. It's awesome. So it's this, this little handle thing right here. So if I pull up on it, it moves the object up. If I push down on it, it moves it. If I turn it this way, it rotates the object. If I tilt it this way, it tilts it. So I can turn and tilt and rotate the object. And we do that instead of with your 3D, you know, picture in, you know, AutoCAD or Blender. Well, we have to look through all of this information, whether it be horizons, you know, are we looking at a horizon? Are we looking at, uh, you know, just the inline and cross lines, you know, and seeing where they eat? And, well, what's going on here? Is that salt or what? Um, here they're looking at a well log here, that's just a one dimensional, but uh, you know, if you have multiple holes going through there, you want to see where all your wells are at. You know, and you can you know, rotate around that 3D space. And that's something that's actually specific to a um, company I work for, the, the visualization software that they built. It's, it's... <laughs> he gets excited. Right? I do get excited. It's infectious. Uh, anyway, except for me, I'm a challenge. <laughs> I don't get so excited about rocks. She'll show you her rock collection if you ever like, you know, are interested. Okay. It's disgusting. Um, so <laughs> I don't have that many rocks, I promise. <laughs> she brought a hundred pounds home from Costa Rica. Oh, Guess who had to carry that? This guy. Anyway, come on, talk about my All right. So we're looking at pre-stack and post-stack. If you guys saw, saw that wiggle trace that we had up earlier, you know, so we've shot the seismic and we've caught all these wiggles. Well, those channels where you see it, Go back to that real quick. I don't know how far back that was. Yeah, let's get right here. So these are at different locations. I probably shouldn't have said that earlier. So this right here, where you see this energy is coming early in time, right? This is in space. So consider this is just a 2D representation. So if our source is here, here's our dynamite or our vibratory truck, and the waves are traveling down into the subsurface and coming back up and being recorded at all these different intervals, right? And they're outputting these traces. So which one? Would you say is closest this this trace or this trace? Which one is closest to the energy source to the dynamite? That's not a rhetorical question. I'm actually asking. Is, anybody, is it is it this side over here that's closer, or this side over here? The left. Yeah, this side over here because it's earlier in time. We know that's going to take time for that for that energy to travel, and we can actually calculate that. We we know about that whole thing about the velocity, right? Change of distance over change of time. <laughs> Think about that one. Well, it's a slope of the curve, so we can take a slope of that. We've got distance and time to figure out the velocity at which that, uh, that wave is propagating. Back to migration. I'm sorry. Um, so this is pre-stack. So what we were looking at was pre-stack. You know, we, we've got this this display here of all the seismic traces. 
We haven't stacked it yet. What we'll do is we'll do a velocity analysis and estimate the velocities at a certain location. We'll move it out, then we'll stack it. And that stack is what gives you the 2D seismic section. Um, and then you'll run, this is a, a post-stack. So you run a migration number. It's not as good as if you run it pre-stack. So before you start doing, the, before you stack it, you've got more traces that you run this migration on. And because all, almost all data processing is statistical analysis, the more traces you have, the more information you have, the better your statistical analysis. And it uh, does a pretty cool job cleaning that up. So what you see here is, uh, is an anticline. I mean, that's, that's a small hill that's buried in the earth. Uh, wave equation migration versus reverse time migration. I wish I understood the mathematics behind this. Give me another five or six years and I might. Uh, it's PhDs. They got this. Um, but what's really interesting is the difference in the pictures and the images. And, you know, Allegra can talk about the interpretation part. I'll talk about the imaging. Um, what you see here is this salt flank, right? You see how that's a salt diaper that's moved up? Well, the difference is, especially if you look where she's got it, you see, you see more resolution, more detail here than you see here. And, and that's, what we're, that's what RTM is really good at doing. And what we're trying to image is exactly what's happening. What does the geology look like underneath the salt flank? And how reverse time migration works is because it calculates, given a wave that traveled, may have traveled down this way and curved around this way, maybe it bounced off here, maybe it hit this salt flank and then came back down here and then bounced back up and came back up here, or maybe it came around like this and went down this way, or maybe it came around like this, went all the way around, hit here, then came back up here, then came up, you know, whatever. It, the, the travel of these waves is very difficult to, um, you know, to estimate, because we really don't know. But that's kind of what reverse time migration does, and it images what's going on in there. So basically it creates a much nicer picture for us interpreters to then try and, and um, you know, find where the oil is, or figure out where the salt is. We don't want to drill salt. In fact, there was a great story I heard this summer where uh, one of the, the managers on the fly kind of said, oh, let's let's put a lot of money on this one spot and buy it, and it turns out it's just a big salt dome. Oops, that was, you know, like a $50 million mistake, so you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is this is more, you can be a geophysicist or a geologist, this is kind of going into the interpretation end of it, and this is what I enjoy doing, is after he has spent all that time processing all this, um, we then go to the service companies like, like PGS where Tony works, or CGG Veritas, there's TGS, there's a bunch of them out there, and we spend, I, uh, we spend a lot of money buying these surveys that they have shot. Um, I know Shell spent like $20 million on one particular survey, so it's not cheap. Um, uh, going back just to top on that, so the acquisition we were showing those boats earlier, yeah, it costs about a million dollars a day to run those. So you figure out, we run those, we've got seven or eight boats, if you figure for one boat, it costs a million dollars a day to run it, so we spend about $320 million a year, right, there's 320 days in a year, am I right on that? 365. 365. Close. Three hundred, yeah, three hundred sixty-five million dollars a year on one boat. I think Brad Pitt is worth like what two hundred fifty million. So we spend more money on one boat than Brad Pitt is worth. You know, I just have the basic. And uh, like I said, we've got seven or eight boats, so it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of money that goes into this. It's just it's not cheap. So you know, when you're the geologist or geophysicist who says, "Yeah, I think uh, we should draw right here," you better be pretty darn sure. <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's expensive. So. So going back to, I'm just going to talk, just do a real quick run through of the petroleum system, kind of generally what we're looking for. So of course, you know, we want to start out, we have to have a source rock. We, you know, these hydrocarbons don't just generate out of thin air. So where is my mouse? Okay, whatever I need it So right here, this is typically, you know, you're going to see a source rock, typically a shale. It's got a lot of organic material in it. Well, once you start covering it with sediments, burying it, um, you know, it gets a lot hotter and you start cooking it. Well, once you start cooking it, you start producing hydrocarbons, they don't want to stay there. You know, they're less dense, they want to start rising up. So typically they'll find some sort of migration pathway. So what we have pictured here is an anticline with the fault running through it. So they're showing the migration path, you know, up the fault and into this kind of nice reservoir rock right here, which is typically we want to, we would like a really good clean sandstone because the clay kind of gums up the works. So we don't want any clay there. Clean sandstone, maybe that's been really well weathered, nice round of grains. So there's a lot of space in those pores to hold oil. And just as an aside, remember we're trying to pull oil out of you know 
teeny tiny pore spaces in these rocks. Um, you know, I know I probably thought when I was little that there were these nice like cavernous places under the ground you pull oil out of. It doesn't work like that at all. Um, so anyway, they, it gets into this reservoir rock, and hopefully, what you've got here is a nice you know ceiling shale over the top because shales aren't very permeable, so you're not going to get them traveling through those shales. And then, of course, you know, the gas will be on top because it's, it's less dense than the oil. And then, you know, there, there's potentially water. In fact, we drilled a well this summer that was Actually, cool exercise. Uh, water. This goes into if you're going into reservoir engineering or if you're into geology or geophysics. So the maximum porosity that a single volume can have is something like 42.5%. And you can actually calculate it. Like I said, it is a cool little experiment that if you, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys think about this at some time. You know, you've got some volume, right? Let's make it a cube. The maximum of space to have is to have, we're going to say in this volume, we've got four spheres, or uh, eight spheres, right? Four on top, four on bottom. So figure out the volume of the cube, then figure out the volume of the spheres, spheres, subtract that, and that'll give you the volume of the pore space. Then you take the ratio of that and uh, come up to 42%. So that's the maximum. That's the best case scenario. We've got perfectly round grains, which never happens. So yeah. You know, it's just one for us to what you're saying. Yeah. It's so yeah, we always hope for a nice clean sandstone. That's what we're looking for in the perfect scenario. So um, this is a piece of seismic that's been interpreted. This is actually from the Gulf of Mexico. This is in the Mad Dog field. Um, these symbols actually indicate some dry holes that were drilled. Um, but there's still something good from drilling a dry hole as you get information from these wells. And so a lot of times they'll actually take some core from these wells, you can analyze the different rock samples, and you can actually determine where the horizons are from each of these wells, and that really helps with the interpretation. And you can see, you know, we don't have um, these flat surfaces that would make it a heck of a lot easier. So you actually see some uh, faults that have been drawn in, you know, a nice anticline here, and the interpreter has actually been able to, you know, put in where all the different rock units are even with all the, having a, all those faults there. So um, it looks like these wells were probably successful though, they found some oil in here. And these are just the sonic and density logs. And wherever they kick, we well, can tell you how where an oil and a shale is. And I've got a, a better image of that in a few slides from here. That's another career opportunity. Uh, well log specialists, well log analysts, and petrophysicists. Um, so here's just again another, are we doing okay on time, by the way? Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Some people have to leave, but yeah. Okay. So, um, again, another interpreted seismic section. Um, this one actually has some salt in it. So you can see right here where this kind of like, I guess, aqua line is. Um, that was some salt. Well, you know, typically it's, it's again, deposited flat. But once you start piling all these sediments on it, salt becomes mobile. It doesn't like to, to stay in that one place because it's less dense than the rock you're piling on top of it. So that's kind of why you're seeing some of these, these hill and valley looking shapes because that salt is wanting to move up. And here, what you're actually seeing is these, these are called anticlines. And this is actually a prograding delta sequence that's being deposited out. And you're filling this kind of basin space here. And then once you kind of fill this space, and you know, sea level's rising and falling in between here, if the sea level starts falling, you start kind of cutting back into some of those deposits you make, moving back up. And then, you know, if sea level rises again, you can start depositing back, you know, deeper. So, Pretty cool, and you can, you know, in, in these deltaic sequences, especially, you can find lots of nice things. We like deltas. Um, whole Niger Delta in North Nigeria, Africa, it's a really nice producing base, and a lot of deltaic deposits there. So, again, just another image of computer technology, some of the 3D uh, images that you can get. Uh, this one is actually a seismic image of an ancient reef in Alberta, Canada, which, of course, we all know is pretty far inland. But uh, 400 million years ago, there was also an inland sea there. So we had some reefs, and then the picture on the bottom left is just uh, a modern day analog of what that would have looked like when it was an ocean. And then, you know, again, just another, another 3D images, uh, image from somebody doing interpretation. And so this is what I want to show you. This is a project that I worked on with um, all of these other gentlemen. Um, there's an organization called the APG, American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and every year, they host the Imperial Barrel Awards, which is uh, basically kind of an oil, oil finding competition. Um, they assign you a specific area in the world, they give you a whole bunch of seismic data, and they say, okay, take this, work up a couple of prospects, 
uh, work up some volume, some economics, put it together in PowerPoint, and try and sell us on why we want to drill your pro you know your prospect as opposed to the other team's prospect. And there's some big prizes involved. If you win your regional competition, I think you get maybe about three thousand dollars, and all the university gets it. And uh, there's actually an international competition too. So I think there's about twelve regions worldwide. And uh, the international competition, I think the prize is about $20,000, but you can also put that on your resume and it looks really fantastic. Um, our team plays fourth in regionals, so uh, we didn't get to get an international competition, but this was our project we worked up. So this is the Bite Basin, and this is kind of very representative of what goes on in the whale industry on a day-to-day -day basis. This might be a project you work on or part of that project anyway. So we just kind of run through this. So. We, we were able to do a lot of research on this basin. We knew it was a working petroleum system and actually had petroleum seeps. Um, most of these systems are not completely closed. You know, they're not perfect. They're a little leaky, but leaky is not necessarily bad because we know there's hydrocarbons there. So you can see some, you know, oil slicks on the surface. And that's kind of a good thing. Plus, there are a couple wells that we had access to that they had some hydrocarbon shows in. But right now, there aren't the producing wells in the Bay Basin. And so, of course, the question is, is why, why can't we you know, find large volumes of oil in there? So one of the potential problems is maybe a seal of integrity. Maybe the shale wasn't thick enough. Maybe it's not laterally continuous enough. Maybe it's a little patchy. Um, or maybe some faults are breaking it up. So, you know, we're getting leaky drop the faults. So we went through, we identified 11 leads. We picked our top two to actually work up for this entire project. Um, I'm going to show you the best looking one, this about $18 billion prospect. So, of course, again, here's, here's Southern Australia. Let me just point out that at one point in time, these two pieces were attached, because that kind of plays into understanding how this works out. So, um, this is the basin we're actually in, the uh, right basin, the Seduna sub-basin. So all of those gray lines you see, those are where um, seismic was acquired. Most of this was actually 2D seismic. We didn't have any of the fancy 3D stuff. But that's about 250,000 square kilometers of data that we had to sift through. And we had to interpret it. We had three wells that were close by, but the closest one was actually the Gnarly Knots well. So we really only had uh, one well to uh, correlate to. Um, and then oil companies do a lot of this. They kind of do this risk analysis and they see what's good, what's bad, where's the potential risk if we drill here. Um, you know, of course, in a perfect world, you want all greens green for go, but uh, the gnarly knots well that we looked at, of course, again, the, the biggest thing that we're worried about with this basin is potential seal fault breach or the quality of the seal itself. Um, they also seem to have a problem with the source, but when we looked through it, there seemed to be plenty of source rock in the area, so I'm not sure what those all do. But, uh, so here we go. So this well originally had five targets they were drilling for. Um, it stopped drilling a little early. Um, they had really bad weather in the south. You know, Australian seas there, but you can see um, this is a sonic log that's been interpreted. Excuse me, a gamma ray log that's been interpreted. So the uh, here, the yellows are the sandstones, and the grays are your shales. It makes it easier to kind of read. Um, they did find, you can see that picture in the bottom left corner, those are the, the fluorescing pieces or some of the uh, petroleum inclusions they found in the core itself. And, you know, Here's your source rock down here. So we definitely have source. We have some migration pathways. This unit right here is an incredibly thick sand. And then above it, you can see a pretty thick shale where that gray unit is. So we went through. These were our favorite prospects, the red blobs. And then those were the two we kind of ended up deciding to work up. So going back to that tectonic reconstruction, I said kind of keep in, in the back of your mind that at one point, Antarctica and Australia were attached. Well, at some point they started rifting, and once you start rifting, you get this kind of initial rift basin that's right here, and you start filling out with some sediments. Well, as they keep moving further apart on the Australian continent, we got a lot of um, volcanism, and it was felsic, it was granite, and you start building mountains. Well, once you start building something, you also start eroding it at the same time. So as time passes, you get this passive trailing margin that's starting to fill with these you know, granitic sands that have been weathered. You get typically really clean reservoir sands with uh, you know, the granite. And so between um, 
the marine shales at the bottom and the sands filling that, you get a really good um, source and reservoir here. So we were, and we're looking for seal on top, and you get some more deltaic base to fill on top. So if you're getting some more, more shales, maybe not quite as much as we'd like to see, but that's kind of the general fill of what we're looking at in the basin. So we really want to understand what's in there. If it's all shale, we're wasting our time. And then there's a bunch of different play types. Um, there are these things, on laps and drapes, that wasn't so exciting for us. But these um, juxtaposed fault blocks, uh, the rollover anticlines, that's a really big deal. You typically, we're looking for oil there. They're a good trap. Um, stratigraphic traps, if you get maybe a really nice sand trapped between some shales, that can be a good place for oil. Um, and again, some fault traps, etc., etc. But ultimately, you see, you know, we've got some source reservoir and seal, and your red, your yellow, and your gray units in there. Then we had to go through and interpret all the seismic that was relevant to us, which takes a while. So we put all our units in, kind of able to come up with a picture. Again, you can see a lot of that faulting through there. And uh, this is just a well tie looking at the gnarly knots. And again, we kind of saw those, those uh, shales and those sands that were in there. There's a lower shaley seal that we didn't see in that other picture. Um, and then what you'll notice is that it's a little bit faulted, but it shouldn't matter because you've got a much thicker shale on top and that nice reservoir in there, so it should just allow hydrocarbons to get trapped within there. So that looked kind of promising to us. And then what we did was we put together this play element fairway map. So we took all of our information about the thickness of our, uh, our reservoir rocks, of our shales, um, where the best source rocks were, and we kind of mapped out where those were. We put them all on top of each other, and our sweet spot is where that hash area is. Um, and then we also determined that the migration was migrating right up into that sweet spot, and we overlaid that on where our prospects were. We just wanted to make sure that where they were, there was potentially oil. So then, you know, we focused in and we did an analysis on these prospects. So I'll show you the, the best one we worked up. This was the, the $18 billion one. So you can see there's there's a cross line here, this A to A prime. That's what, what line you're looking at through here. And this was a nice target because you actually had two targets with one well. Um, you have that, that top volume and that bottom volume. So you've got some seals between each and that reservoir rock. And this is kind of more that e decline style that we like. It's much easier and, and safe. And so you can kind of see the volume we design to determine for zone one and then for zone two below it. And then this is another side view. It doesn't look quite as impressive from the side. But we worked up some volumes. And the oil industry uses kind of P90, P50, and P10. And in this scenario, the P10 is like probably the absolute best volume you're going to get out of this. Um, we typically stick more around the P50. It's probably a little more realistic. But we're still looking at you know, 800 million yeah. barrels potentially in this prospect. So once you kind of do a risking and you work up the numbers combined, we're getting about $18 billion from this volume. But the other side of that, of course, is you know always how much is it going to cost us to then pull it out of the ground. Um, that gnarly knots well was drilled in 2004, and it was actually stopped short, so it didn't cost as much 